Moving on to the next section, which is uh, inverse circular functions. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I think uh, inverse circular um, causes a lot of grief um, for some because it involves lots of bits of information. And in fact, the whole topic of trigonometry involves lots of bits of information that you need to be aware of and that you need to remember. And again, all of this is on the formula sheet. However, um, it can get a little bit confusing We've already looked at uh, sketching reciprocal functions, sec, uh, cosec and cot, um, and uh, laying on top of that um, sketch graphs of inverse sine, inverse cos, inverse tan, um, it can certainly cause confusion sometimes. But um, hopefully if you follow the steps, um, you'll get through it. And uh, I don't think it's as bad as it looks sometimes. So inverse circular functions, um, as soon as we're looking at an inverse function doesn't matter what the function has to be then the function has to be one to one and as we all know if the function is not one to one a uh, an inverse will not exist but we can make it one to one by restricting the domain and probably the most um, common one that we use is uh, the quadratic um, you know and you would have seen many times questions involving a quadratic where you've got to restrict the domain to create a one-to-one -one function therefore find an inverse function um, and the one that we usually use if we use a simple y equals x squared the one we usually use is uh, x greater than or equal to zero so if we restrict the domain x is greater than or equal to zero we have a one-to-one -one function therefore we can find an inverse and that's what we're doing here with uh, inverse circular functions we take our original function we know it's not one-to-one -one, and obviously sine is not one-to-one -one. Um, and if you remember how to determine a one-to-one -one function it's a horizontal line test if a horizontal line cuts at more than one spot function is not one-to-one -one. So we need to restrict the domain for sine. And there are an infinite set of options. Um, you could restrict the domain so that it's negative 3 pi on 2 to negative pi on 2. You could restrict the domain so it's negative pi on 2 to pi on 2. You could use pi on 2 to 3 pi on 2. There's an infinite set of restrictions that you could apply. However, the one that we use is minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. That's the one that makes the most sense to have it symmetrical about the y-axis in terms of the restriction. And so we restrict our sine function so that x is always between minus pi and 2 to pi and 2, which means that my y values are going to be restricted to having values between negative 1 and 1. So basically what we do is we define a restricted sine function. And so we write it as a restricted domain, negative pi and 2, oop, negative pi and 2, 2 pi and 2, onto the reals where f of x is sine x. Now, when I was at school a long time ago, uh, to signify it was a restricted sine function, we used to use a capital S. Um, and in my writing in this, I will use capital S. Um, but it is the same nowadays as little sine x. Um, there is no use of a capital sign anymore, but I am still using it. I like to use it um, just to signify that it does represent the restricted sine function but um, on an exam um, there's no distinction between a capital S and a little s. Um, so that's our restricted sine and we all know that um, with a um, an inverse function um, domain and range swap over. So when it comes to sketching our um, inverse function based on 
our based on our um, sine function if we swap over domain and range so for my inverse function and I'll just pop it under here so now my inverse function where we swap X and Y so X is going to equal sine Y and so we get rid of sine by inventing this notation so Y is now going to be inverse sine of X um, where now the domain of the original function becomes the range of the inverse function so that has to be between minus pi and 2 and pi and 2 and the range of the inverse becomes the domain of sorry the range of the original becomes the domain of the inverse so x is now going to be between negative 1 and 1 so negative 1 and 1 um, and then negative pi and 2 pi and 2 now you'll notice that um, if you look at the scale on this negative pi and 2 is around about negative 1 and a half so negative 1 would be around about around about here and negative pi and 2 pi and 2 is around about one and a half so that might be around about there and it's a reflection in the line y equals x and so your inverse sine function would look something like that um, and that's how it comes about so we restrict sine um, interchange x and y um, to get rid of a sine y we invent inverse sine um, as a notation so y is inverse sine of x and domain and range swaps over um, and you can see there that uh, that's what we've just looked at so there's your original um, and it's important that when you're sketching that um, your scale is reasonable you know pi on 2 is around about um, 1.5 so pi on 2 is bigger than 1 so on your sketch graphs you need to show that um, don't just you know plot them any old how um, have a rough guide as to what those values should be um, the other thing to note is that um, you can have arc sine representing inverse sine um, and there is a C missing there, there's a typo there, that should be arc sine of X um, represents exactly the same thing so whether you see arc sine or inverse sine um, it is still the inverse sine function um, the other thing to note is that um, you can have the inverse sine operating on the original sign and usually an inverse operating on its original will give you X um, and where that comes from is this idea here that if you've got an inverse function operating on the original function it will give you a value of X just like the original function operating on the inverse will give you X as well it's like they cancel each other out a square and a square root or a square root and a square so inverse sine of sine X will give you X as long as X is between um, minus pi and 2 to pi and 2 and that restriction is really talking about first and fourth quadrant so um, it's important to recognize that that restriction is in place it's either first or fourth quadrant um, if you're talking about sine of inverse sine well they will cancel as long as x is between minus one and one um, so that's something else that does occur sometimes and we'll have a look at some uh, questions based on that in a minute now using exactly the same theory um, we can also restrict the um, 
the cost function. So um, we can restrict the domain. This time, the restriction on cos is um, zero to pi. You could have gone minus pi to zero, just like sine. You could have um, had all sorts of restrictions, but the one that we use is zero to pi, where um, f of x is equal to cos of x. And again, I'm going to use capital C just because I'm used to it. And I I think it just signifies the restricted function nicely. So um, that's your restricted function. And you can see there that the um, range is between minus one and one, just like sine. And domain is zero to pi. And again, if you um, swap x and y, domain and range swaps over so now my domain is minus one to one my range is zero to pi and again if you reflect in the line y equals x just like you do with any um, inverse function and it's original that sort of graphical relationship it's um, a reflection in y equals x and so you end up with uh, that standard graph now the other thing, just like um, inverse sine, um, inverse sine takes values in first and fourth quadrant. Inverse cos, um, and again, um, just like inverse sine, inverse sine minus pi and two, pi and two, that's first and fourth. Inverse cos is first and second. So zero to pi, signifying that your values are in the first or second quadrant. Um, if they're negative, it's got to be second quadrant because cos is negative in the second quadrant. Um, and also, again, this arc cos appears. Um, so again, arc cos is the same as um, arc sine. Both represent the inverse function, another way of writing it. Inverse tan, same idea. Um, and to make inverse tan um, a possibility, we need to restrict the tan function. Um, and just like sine, um, the tan function is restricted to minus pi and two to pi and two. Just be careful that we're not including those endpoints. So for inverse tan, it's open bracket minus pi and two to pi and two. Um, so you just need to be sure that um, you don't include those endpoints because they're asymptotes on your tan graph. Um, and because you've got asymptotes on your tan graph, you will have asymptotes on your inverse tan graph. And there they are, pi and two minus pi and two, and the domain is the set of real numbers. So again, domain and range swap over. Um, and so there's your um, inverse tan function. Um, and that should have um, inverse tan on it because your domain is minus pi and two to pi and two, and that's just a set of real numbers. So that's your inverse tan function. Um, and again, it's um, arc tan. So I suppose this is where a lot of the confusion comes into place for for you guys, um, because you've got domains and ranges of your original sine, cos, and tan. You've got domains and ranges of your inverse trig functions, inverse sine, inverse cos, inverse tan. You need to be careful um, about those domains and ranges. Um, but again, they are on the formula sheet, but you will use them so often that um, you will know them. You will know them. So there's a summary there. So um, in a lot of ways, um, they should be fairly obvious if you think of the original sine, cos and tan function and where the restrictions are. Um, this is what we spoke about before. Um, these relationships here. So as we said that inverse sine of x, if you take the sine of that relationship, then you will get x. They seem to cancel out. Uh, 
um, as long as x is between negative 1 and 1 there, and as long as x is between negative pi and 2 to pi and 2 there. Um, so in other words, that angle needs to be either in the first or the fourth quadrant for it to cancel out, if you like. Um, so, simple example, if you had uh, inverse sine of sine pi and 6, um, that would equal pi and 6. Sine of pi and 6 is a half, inverse sine of a half is pi and 6, um, and they cancel out because pi and 6 is in the first quadrant. Um, if you said sine of pi and 6 is equal to a half, and therefore inverse sine of a half is 5 pi and 6, well then that would be incorrect because it needs to be between minus pi and 2, pi and 2. It's got to be first or fourth. It cannot be second or third. Same thing with um, cos, an inverse cos. So cos, inverse cos cancel as long as x is between negative 1 and 1. Inverse cos, cos cancels as long as x is between 0 and pi. And in other words, it has to be first or second. And then for the same argument, um, tan of inverse tan will cancel as long as x is a real number. Inverse tan of tan will cancel as long as x is between minus pi and 2, pi and 2. That is, again, like sine, first and fourth. Um, and this is important. If x does not lie in the required range, then you must find an equivalent angle that does fall in the range. So here's an example. So you want inverse cos of cos 5 pi and 4. That does not equal 5 pi and 4 because it's not in 0 to pi. It's not an element of the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant. Uh, sorry, or the second quadrant. So you need to work out its equivalent angle. So cos of 5 pi and 4. Um, it's going to be a negative result. It's the same as cos of negative 3 pi and 4. And cos of negative 3 pi and 4 is the same as cos of 3 pi and 4. So what you need to do is to convert this into an equivalent expression so that the angle is between 0 and pi using your knowledge of um, cast, cos fourth, all se uh, first, sine, second, tan, third. So cos of 5 pi and 4 is the same as cos of 3 pi and 4. It is between 0 and pi. So inverse cos and cos will cancel to give you 3 pi and 4. So just be careful of that. You know, you can't just cancel if the angle's not between um, 0 and pi for inverse cos. And these come into play as well. Um, cos of negative theta is cos of theta. Sine of negative theta is sine of theta. Uh, sorry, is negative sine theta. So, um, if we have a look at uh, question 71, there's the uh, first one there, inverse sine of root 3 on 2. Um, remember your inverse sine, the domain is between minus 1 and 1. That's the first thing you need to check. Um, it is, root 3 on 2 is an element of negative 1 to 1, so we can work that out. Then we think of our triangles. So the sine of what angle gives you root 3 on 2. Um, and hopefully you recognise that it's pi on 3. So the answer there is um, pi on 3. Um, now you could have also gone second quadrant. You could have said sine of 2 pi and 3 also gives me root 3 on 2. However, that's not between minus pi and 2 to pi and 2. So therefore, 2 pi and 3 would not be a solution. So you need to write that as pi and 3. So you need to be careful.
Okay, so we've got inverse cos of negative one on root two. Determine whether an inverse exists, does the bracket value fall within the accepted domain? So again, this thing here has to be between negative one and one. And you can see there that it is. Um, so therefore, um, my inverse function will exist. I can work that out. Um, it's a negative one on root two. So my answer has to be between, um, my answer has to be between um, zero to pi. Now, that means it's either first or second quadrant. And because the result is a negative, you know it's going to be a second quadrant. And second quadrant, if we're dealing with a 1 on root 2, must be pi and 4. So to get my second quadrant angle, it's always pi minus theta, which is pi minus pi and 4, which gives me 3 pi and 4. Um, you cannot use... Um, the third quadrant angle, which is 5 pi and 4. Um, so you need, again, to make sure that your domain and range are satisfied.